All right, I think we have a great, uh, great quorum gathering. So good afternoon, welcome to this Translational Applications and Public Health Lecture. Uh, as you know, this is a collaboration between the Institute for Public Health and Medicine, uh, or IFAM, and the Northwestern University Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, or NUCATS. Um, I'm Dr. Don Lloyd-Jones. I'm a cardiologist and cardiovascular epidemiologist and chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine here at Feinberg. Also have the honor of being the president of the American Heart Association this year. Um, I want to thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, during today's presentation, uh, I'd like to ask you please to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen in Zoom uh, to, to provide your questions. Please do not use the chat function because uh, we won't be able to monitor that one as closely. Um, we will have time at the end of this presentation for question and answers, so please do engage. Uh, this promises to be a really wonderful lecture, and I know that there will be lots of great questions. Um, it is a real honor always to introduce one of your mentees, but it's a particular honor today for me to introduce Dr. Sadia Khan. Dr. Khan is a cardiologist here at Northwestern Medicine. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the departments of medicine and preventive medicine. Um, and she's also the associate program director for the Cardiovascular Disease Fellowship Program and the director of research for the section of heart failure uh, within the division of cardiology. She, uh, in her clinical, uh, wearing her clinical hat, she has expertise in prevention and management of heart failure in women's cardiovascular health and in cardiovascular genetics. Um, and is also um, very active in her research life, focusing on the epidemiology, risk prediction, and mechanisms of heart failure across the life course. And I would say is really one of the leaders in a new field looking at primary prevention of heart failure, uh, trying to prevent the onset of heart failure in the first place, and has really done some seminal work, which she's going to share with us today, uh, in, in how we should think about the prevention of heart failure in new paradigms. She is truly a rising superstar within the fields of cardiology and cardiovascular disease epidemiology. She has been awarded numerous awards uh, in recognition of her really ground, groundbreaking work. And I know that we're in for a treat today with her lecture. So Dr. Khan, please take it away. Thank you so much, Don, for that very kind and humbling introduction. It's really, I think you missed the part about how this has really been um, work that I've learned and so much from your mentorship. And a lot of what you'll hear today, I think is things that we've discussed many times um, over the past several years. So thank you everyone um, for joining today and thank you to NewCats and IFAM for their sponsorship of this seminar. I'm really excited to be sharing some of our thoughts around the primary prevention of heart failure and how we can potentially use a risk-based paradigm. The objectives for the next 45 minutes will be to define the epidemiology of heart failure, morbidity, and mortality, to discuss the approaches that we have available in our toolbox for risk stratification with short and long-term risk prediction, to discover risk-enhancing factors for heart failure and how these may inform precision prevention approaches, and to identify evidence-based strategies as well as novel emerging approaches for risk-based prevention of heart failure. So beginning with the epidemiology of heart failure, how does heart failure compare with other leading causes of death? And shown here are absolute counts for deaths in 2019 pre-COVID for heart disease, cancer, chronic lower respiratory diseases, and diabetes is the leading causes of death. Now, I'll note also that heart disease still outranks COVID even in the terrible year that we're having as being the number one cause of death. But when you look at the specific subtypes of heart disease, we've come a long way in being able to treat and manage ischemic heart disease, in part because we do have a way to um, ascertain risk for ischemic heart disease and treat, but not so for heart failure. And if we look at the absolute counts, there are over 200,000 deaths in 2019 and similar numbers in 2020 for deaths related to heart failure, where heart failure was a contributing cause. How has this changed over time? Shown here is work that we did from the CDC National Vital Statistics System, where we looked at age-adjusted mortality rates shown in the panel for younger adults, 35 to 64, and older adults who died between 65 to 84 from 1999 to 2017. And on the y-axis, you see age-adjusted death rates per 100,000. There are three main takeaways that I, I think are really important here in both of these panels that are also shared patterns. First, the age-adjusted mortality rate for heart failure started to increase in 2011. And we see that in both younger and older adults as well as across all demographic subgroups. Next, burden is disproportionately higher in non-Hispanic uh, 
Black adults, particularly non-Hispanic Black men in both age groups. And third, the greatest relative increases have occurred in younger adults. So despite the advent of novel therapies, new devices, and different types of procedures that have come about in the last two decades in cardiovascular medicine, what we're seeing is increases in heart failure mortality, suggesting that prevention is urgent, and especially in younger adults as we start thinking about how we can approach prevention across the life course beginning early in adulthood. What about hospitalizations? So patterns for hospitalizations may differ from mortality. Unfortunately, that's not the case that we see in the United States. These are data from the nationwide readmission database and shown our curves from 2010 to 2017. And these authors looked at both primary heart failure hospitalizations shown in the green curve in the top, as well as subsets of this. So unique patients admitted for heart failure, unique patients with a single heart failure admission, and those who came back or had readmission for heart failure or readmission for any cause at 30 days or had at least two heart failure admissions. Unfortunately, the pattern was the same in all of these groups where there was an increase from 2014 onward. We know that the demographic profile of the country is changing. Mean age of the population is on the rise, which is an important risk factor for heart failure. In addition, obesity and severe obesity is increasing and prediabetes and diabetes are increasing. In addition, control for hypertension is decreasing. So all of these are setting up the perfect storm for having more cases of heart failure as we go on. In fact, back in 2012, this analysis was published in circulation, looking at patterns of change in heart failure, trying to account for changing demographics as well as risk factor levels. And this analysis predicted that by 2030, which we're not that far away from now, heart failure prevalence would be greater than 8 million or one in 33 US adults. In addition, they estimated the cost shown in the figure here that um, total direct and indirect costs would exceed 70 billion by 2030 if nothing changed in the patterns that we're observing. While we've seen that the overall burden of heart failure has increased, part of what's also changed is the type of heart failure that we're seeing. These data are from the Atherosclerosis Risk and Community Study, or ERIC study, which looked at across four US communities and looked at rates of incident or first-time hospitalization for heart failure in race and sex subgroups. Now, in all of these subgroups shown in the black line, total heart failure cases are going up between 2005 and 2014. But what's really telling is that the line shown in blue or the line for HEF-PEF or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction with an ejection fraction greater than 50% is driving most of these trends. And while we do have many more therapies for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we have very few therapies for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which makes prevention even more of paramount importance. Some of our own work has actually looked at the difference in prognosis for these subtypes of heart failure in the Kaiser Permanente system, where we've analyzed data from over 800,000 members who um, were followed between 2011 and 2018 and were adults aged 30 years and older. One of the questions that always comes up is, is there a difference in prognosis between these two subtypes as we start thinking about how we may want to approach prevention? And unfortunately, there's not much difference. Shown here are survival curves that are unadjusted for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in black and um, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in red. And what we see is that survival remains quite dismal in the contemporary era after a heart failure diagnosis with a fatality rate of near 50% at five years. One of the advantages of this health system is that we were also able to look across the spectrum of ages. And unfortunately, what we found was quite dismal, including a poor prognosis in younger adults, suggesting that risk of heart failure is present and prevalent in the population, even on younger age groups, such as 50 to 64 and 30 to 49, and that the prognosis is equally poor for both subtypes of heart failure. And the actual prevalence of each subtype is about half as well in the population. So as we look at this and we think about the different stages of heart failure shown here from the most recent um, guideline definition in the Journal of Cardiac Failure, the new universal definition, we see that the stages of heart failure do incorporate this idea of risk for heart failure that comes before symptomatic disease. 
And it's important to note that even with our best therapy approaches, guideline-directed medical therapy, GDMT, risk factor modification, the best we can get to when someone's developed symptoms of heart failure is heart failure in remission. And I think that's important that this transition, when someone goes from pre-heart failure or stage B to symptomatic heart failure, there's no turning back. And that's really important as we think about approaches for primary prevention, that being able to identify those who are in stages A or B and, and, and approach them with prevention strategies is really important. But this overall group may be very heterogeneous. An individual who has obesity is very different than an individual that has left ventricular hypertrophy that labels them as stage B. So how do we better characterize this group will be what we'll spend the rest of the time on. I hope I've convinced you in this introduction section that hospitalized heart failure, symptomatic or stage C or D heart failure is really the tip of the iceberg that we're dealing with here. But below the surface is where we need to shift our focus in the general population and think about ways that we can calculate risk to estimate a risk to match the intensity of prevention to risk, define mechanisms of disease prevention, and design interventions that focus on prevention. So what's the first way that we can potentially do this? And that's looking at multivariable risk assessment and how do we approach short and long-term risk prediction? So this overall schematic outlines um, the key principle that we'll talk about that was first put forth at the 27th Bethesda Conference over two decades ago, and is the cornerstone of cardiovascular risk um, prevention and primary prevention for atherosclerotic disease, where in a given population, we know that there is a variance of risk, and we want to estimate that risk using multivariable risk tools to be able to identify those who are at high risk for heart failure and therefore be able to match the intensity of prevention efforts to the absolute risk of the patient. Where are the heart failure guidelines in terms of risk-based prevention? Well, this is the only recommendation that currently exists in the last iteration of the 2017 guidelines that provides a class of recommendation 2A and level of evidence B for patients at risk of developing heart failure, natriuretic peptide biomarker-based screening followed by team-based care, including a cardiovascular specialist optimizing GDMT can be useful for prevention both of systolic or diastolic dysfunction. Now, this is the only recommendation in that um, version of the guidelines because it was based on two trials that had been conducted around that time, focusing on the primary prevention of heart failure, the STOP-HF study and the Pontiac study, and both focused on biomarker-based prevention. So how did these trials demonstrate benefit of biomarker-based prevention? So the STOP-HF study shown on the first panel here and the Pontiac on the second panel, both recruited patients who are at high risk for heart failure. In STOP-HF, they included patients that had a risk factor like hypertension or atherosclerotic disease and randomized to a strategy where if they had, uh, they received BNP screening and if the BNP was greater than 50, they were referred for guideline directed medical therapy with a team-based approach. Now in STOP-HF, only one third of people had a BNP over 50, suggesting that the biomarker-based approach may not be the most efficient in a general population. Despite that, that intervention showed, um, showed significant reduction in um, heart failure events over follow-up. In the Pontiac study, they took a different approach. They screened patients with diabetes who are known to be at higher risk and have higher BNP levels and included only those who had an NT pro BNP, in this case, greater than 100. Again, those who had, were referred or those who were randomized to the intervention received more intensive risk factor modification. And in both of these trials, the main message was intensifying risk factor modification with guideline-directed medical therapy or disease-modifying therapy can prevent heart failure. So we know that heart failure is preventable. It's finding the right people who would benefit from it. So what can we do in terms of risk-based prevention? So I think one of the things that was most helpful to me as we were thinking about this was, what can we learn from how we've done this um, in ASCVD risk prevention and risk assessment? And in the 2019 primary prevention guidelines that were led by Dr. Lloyd-Jones, one of the things that I think was very helpful was this outline of thinking about a three-step approach to calculating risk, personalizing so that we consider risk-enhancing factors, specifically family history of premature disease, chronic kidney disease, sex-specific risk factors, 
and then consider reclassifying with tools such as CAC um, for who should um, who would benefit from lipid lowering therapy. What if we applied a similar approach to heart failure? And here's an overall schematic that we recently published to think about how this might be the case. To date, heart failure risk management has primarily focused on risk factor controls by in individuals who have hypertension or have diabetes, but we know that applying multivariable risk modeling so that we can integrate risk factor levels across, um, uh, across risk factor domains may be a more effective way to identify risk. And once we identify who's at risk, could we personalize and reclassify to target those who are at highest risk with the most intensive prevention efforts? So how can we go about calculating risk? So this was the question that we wanted to try to address first. And we approach this by um, thinking about what are the available data or um, available cohort data that would have access to a large generalizable population sample free of cardiovascular disease that we could follow for incident heart failure. And this work um, that I worked on with Don was really um, helpful to try to understand how we could potentially create generalizable risk prediction equations where we were able to pull um, cohorts, including the atherosclerosis risk in community study, the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, cardiovascular health study, the coronary artery risk development in young adults study, and the Framingham heart study. So over five cohorts, over 20,000 people across the United States to develop a risk production equation. And shown here is a schematic of the online web tool that's available in the um, URL here as well with the individual risk factors that we included. As we discussed what the potential risk factors could be that could be included in the model, one of the things that was really important was being able to utilize risk factors that were readily available in the primary care setting. While BNP has a lot of value and um, has a lot of data for predicting heart failure, it's not something that's routinely assessed and may be useful in sequential risk assessment once someone's risk has been identified and it's not clear if they're at very low risk or very high risk, but using risk factor levels that were already available to the clinician or to the primary care doctor felt like the place to start that would allow it to be the most generalizable. What we saw was that these um, risk prediction equations were um, well calibrated and we were able to um, validate them in two additional external cohorts, the Jackson Heart Study, which is a study of non-Hispanic Black individuals and the PREVEN study, which is a European cohort. And shown here are two representative images for the calibration plots from Jackson Heart Study in Black men and Black women. And what you can see if this um, diagonal line is the line of unity where there's perfect calibration, we see very good calibration for both Black men and women. Since then, we've actually moved on and been able to validate the um, risk equations in our own health record here, leveraging resources from new cats and being able to put together a cohort of over 30,000 patients who were receiving primary care and did not have cardiovascular disease between the ages of 30 and 79 and showed that our risk model was um, adequate at discrimination and well calibrated. And shown here are um, deciles of predicted probability as well as observed probability of heart failure in each race and sex group of white men, white women, black men, and black women. Since our original publication, there's been multiple publications that have applied the PCPHF tool or the pooled cohort equations to prevent heart failure in various um, diverse settings. So I showed you the calibration plots from Jackson Heart Study and our PREVENT study where we also validated it. We've since validated in chronic kidney disease cohort, the CRIC cohort, um, the data from our health record as well as in the health record in Israel that included over 1 million individuals. And two other groups have also um, applied the PCPHF tool in NHANES 3, which is an older US population as well as a Flemish study. Overall, the aggregate data shows that this tool is generalizable across a broad range of populations in a primary prevention setting. But if we take a step back, some of the data I presented earlier showed that some of the deaths that are occurring from heart failure are occurring quite young and in less than 65. And we know that when we use risk prediction tools, these traditional short-term risk models identify middle-aged and older men and women that are at risk because a lot of the risk is driven in large part by age. 
So 10-year risk equations are very helpful when someone's middle-aged or older, but it misses our risk assessment, our opportunity to identify people earlier in the life course. And to try to answer that question, we wanted to think about how we could potentially integrate long-term risk models to be applied in tandem to identify risk earlier in the life course, and specifically use long-term risk assessment to identify those who may be at low short-term risk because someone's 40 and in the next 10 years, they might not develop heart failure, but yet they may have high blood pressure or diabetes and still carry a very high long-term risk for heart failure. So we set about answering this question in another pooled cohort sample. And here we use data from Eric Mesa Cardia, Framingham Heart and Framingham Offspring, put together a cohort of about 25,000 people with over 500 person years of follow-up. And shown here are the calibration plots. And one of the important distinctions for the long-term risk prediction was being able to adjust for competing risk of death that was occurring not due to heart failure to ensure that over this long time horizon, we weren't overestimating risk for heart failure. And what we were able to demonstrate is that our risk prediction tool had excellent discrimination as well as good calibration in each of the race and sex subgroups shown here. And again, you see our tenfold validation with the various colored dots are all hovering around that line of equity showing good calibration. So is it indeed true that those who are at low short-term risk may be at high long-term risk? And if we look at a general population sample cross-sectional survey data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey from the um, two most recent cycles from 2015 to 2018, we're able to put together a generalizable sample of about 1,500 participants that represent 53 million Americans. And on um, average, the median short-term risk was 0.8% in this age group and was a, the long-term risk was 11%. Shown here in the overall bar, you can see in the gray are those who have concordant risk, low 10 year and low 30 year, which is the majority of the population. But in red are the group that we really are interested in that may be missed by just short term risk assessment alone. They have low 10 year risk, but have high 30 year risk. And in the blue are those who have high 10 year and 30 year risk. And you can see across the demographic subgroups that there are varying percentages of individuals and including in the younger adults where we're seeing some discordance, especially in that 50 to 59 year old age range that have low tenure but have high 30 year risk that are really important to consider so that we're not missing opportunities for prevention, especially focusing on lifestyle and behavioral interventions. So hopefully I've made the case now that we need multivariable risk assessment to be able to identify those individuals who are at highest risk. But how do we personalize this? And there are many other factors that we didn't yet even talk about that may be risk enhancing factors that increase someone's risk for heart failure. So if we think about this second stage that we talked about, once we've calculated baseline risk using traditional risk factors, how do we personalize and think about risk enhancing factors and heart failure the same way that has been applied for ASCVD. So in this schematic, the traditional heart failure risk factors are shown here on the left and not a surprise to anyone on the call, I'm sure, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, tobacco use. But on the right side are risk factors that are perhaps emerging with um, growing evidence in the epidemiologic literature for risk for heart failure. Chronic lung disease or impaired lung health precedes and predicts heart failure. Chronic kidney disease, of course, is a very powerful risk factor for heart failure, adverse pregnancy outcomes, and of course, emerging data for COVID-19, because no talk is complete in this day and age without mentioning COVID-19. So if we look at what we know about traditional risk factors, um, one of our um, heart failure fellows led this analysis looking in some of our cohorts to ask the question of what is the population attributable fraction of traditional risk factors. So if we combined all of these risk factors and eliminated them from each race and sex group, how much of heart failure would we be potentially able to eliminate? And the answer is actually surprising if we think about these are the leading risk factors for heart failure, only 50% um, our population attributable fraction was only 50%. And in this analysis, we looked at long-term risk and adjusted for competing risk of death. Now that says to me that targeting these risk factors would largely present, prevent a majority of heart failure, but there's a lot of unmeasured risk. And potentially some of these risk enhancing factors may be the reason that we're seeing um, 
you know, different phenotypes of heart failure. Particularly, I think when we look at these distinct um, risk enhancing factors, and there are many more than just the ones mentioned here, including inflammatory diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, um, but I think focusing on these as examples, we can think about the general mechanisms of these non-traditional risk factors as potentially activating the immune system, causing generalized inflammation, potentially um, markers in the lung that may be activated and act upon the heart or myocardium leading to heart failure, skeletal muscle, kidney endothelial activation, particularly endothelial dysfunction, which appears to be a driving mechanism for the subtype of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and different mechanisms within the GI tract. Now this overall schematic suggests that all of these are interconnected and that potentially the mechanisms that are acting on the heart may identify new targets for prevention in addition to targeting the traditional risk factors that we know of. But I think one question that remains unanswered and is something that I'm very interested in is, are these non-traditional risk factors markers or mediators? And potentially are there shared upstream risk factors? We think about chronic lung disease and heart failure as smoking part of the upstream risk factor that may be contributing to risk of both. In adverse pregnancy out outcomes, diet, physical activity, things that we know are associated with complications during pregnancy, and in, in turn, pregnancy complications that are associated with future risk of heart failure, are these potentially just a marker of what we know about heart failure risk? And if we think about more broadly upstream social factors, well, clinical factors and uh, health and behavior factors are really um, a reflection of physical environment, social and economic factors and are important targets for heart failure prevention as well. And we can't really ignore the fact that a lot of the driving or traditional risk factors that we spoke about, like obesity, hypertension, diabetes, are influenced heavily by fundamental causes of health inequity like structural and systemic racism. And in order to comprehensively target prevention for heart failure, we need to incorporate social determinants of health into our approaches as well. So given that we have an overall framework for multivariable risk calculation, and we have potentially ways to personalize or identify risk-enhancing factors, what are the strategies that we can now apply in a risk-based paradigm? So we've talked about several components of risk factors, non-modifiable risk factors like age and sex, the traditional risk factors and non-traditional risk factors that we spent some time discussing Genetics plays a role. We know there are specific uh, commonly occurring variants like transthyretin amyloid, as well as rare variants like Titan that may enrich um, and increase someone's risk for heart failure, social determinants of health. And if we have a comprehensive assessment and are able to individualize this for each patient, what are our potential approaches for risk reduction? And I think we really wanna focus on primordial and primary prevention. Again, referring back to that schematic that once someone develops symptoms of heart failure, it's a very different trajectory and different approach, approach that we'd be need, needing to take. So where are the guidelines in terms of prevention of heart failure? Well, there's really one main recommendation in the last iteration of the guidelines. That was a class of recommendation one and level of evidence B that in patients at increased risk of stage A heart failure, so in that pre-heart failure range with hypertension, the optimal blood pressure should be less than 130 over 80. And this of course was based on the SPRINT trial data that had come out several years prior to this. So um, as you all know, SPRINT was a randomized controlled trial that looked at intensive blood pressure lowering for um, and compared groups to um, targeting less than 140 in the intensive, or sorry, less than 140 in the standard treatment and less than 120 millimeters of mercury in the intensive treatment. And the primary outcome um, was statistically significant with a hazard ratio of 0.75 shown here. But I think what's really important to look at as we look at the various secondary outcomes is that heart failure had the greatest effect size and was driving a majority of the effect that was seen in the primary outcome. And that's not surprising. We know that lowering blood pressure can reduce risk of heart failure, but it's so important even over a short term that this is where the greatest benefit was seen. 
One of the questions we wanted to ask and um, were able to do this post hoc analysis of the sprint data was that even among this older and enriched population that was enrolled in sprint was um, the risk reduction similar in those who were at lower predicted risk, intermediate predicted risk or high predicted risk based on turtiles of our pooled cohort equations to prevent heart failure or PCPHF tool. And so shown in these each of these panels, you can see the differences between the standard treatment curve in blue and the red um, for the intensive treatment. And there is um, a greater uh, both absolute and relative risk reduction that was seen in those individuals who were predicted at baseline to have a higher risk of heart failure. The absolute risk being reduction being greater in those who have a higher risk coming in makes sense. But I think it's helpful to see that there was this trend seen towards greater benefit, which may suggest that targeting those who are at higher risk of heart failure may allow us to focus and direct resources for more intensive blood pressure lowering. The study wasn't powered specifically to look at these subgroups, so I think it's important to say it doesn't take away from the importance of intensive blood pressure lowering in an overall population. But given how difficult it is, given how many side effects are, are um, observed with intensive blood pressure lowering, it may help us focus on specific subsets that are at greater risk to try to get to goal in that population. If we go a step backward and also think about primordial prevention, um, I know this graph is familiar to many of you, but it's always important to stress that while we may be talking about thresholds for treatment, whether it's 120 or 130 or 140, risk of blood pressure shown for our systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure in these curves and um, in this figure ischemic heart disease is continuous. There isn't a threshold effect at which, you know, 130 magically people have, um, if we're lower than 130, you have low risk. And so I think that's a really important point as we think about how to approach blood pressure or risk factor lowering is that potentially identifying both pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical approaches to either prevent the onset of high blood pressure or to lower blood pressure could be very effective. Um, the prior analysis shown was from an older analysis from 20 years ago that looked at over 1 million people and had uh, individual level data performed an individual meta-analysis. and very similar results were published in the past year and actually broke down the type of cardiovascular disease. And this was work done from uh, some of the observational cohort data in the US and looking at Cardia, Eric, Mesa, and Framingham. And shown in each panel was that not only the relationship that you saw in the prior graph for ischemic heart disease, but also if we break down uh, subtypes of cardiovascular disease and importantly heart failure shown here, that we see that similar graded and continuous relationship with the reference group here being less than 100. The other important point shown in this figure is that in, um, in red, women had a higher risk for heart failure at a lower blood pressure than men where that risk began at one, um, 110 to 119. So I think that's another important point as we think about really primordial prevention strategies for keeping blood pressure low. The hypertension guidelines in 2017 had this really nice table that looked at non-pharmaceutical options. And I think this is always helpful and something that I refer to when talking with patients about lowering blood pressure, particularly when multiple agents are needed or to avoid medication altogether in terms of how effective physical activity, diet, weight loss, as well as reducing dietary sodium, increasing dietary potassium, or reducing alcohol consumption can be as well. If we look at antihypertensive, so at the point of stage A where someone needs therapy, there have actually been very few studies that have compared directly different types of antihypertensive therapy. I think the data from SPRINT are very clear that getting to intensive blood pressure control is the most important. So using different strategies if needed is um, as needed to get to that goal. But in this really nice Bayesian network meta-analysis that was published about a decade ago now, it showed this direct relationship in, um, between different types of antihypertensives. And I think the key takeaway is that even though we would think of ACE inhibitors and ARBs as being 
very effective at preventing heart failure. Diuretics actually came out as the most effective. And that might be because if people are at high risk for heart failure, we know many people may have subclinical heart failure where they may have symptoms, but not yet diagnosed or may be on that pathway or closer to um, symptomatic or stage C heart failure. Diuretics can be very helpful at alleviating symptoms. What's really important I think is to note is that calcium channel blockers, beta blockers and alpha blockers were not very effective in preventing heart failure. So again, when making choices for antihypertensives, it may be helpful to know what an individual's risk for heart failure is and prioritizing those disease modifying agents. And as we'll talk about shortly, um, emerging data for SGLT2 inhibitors as well for this in, in recent years. So, and, you know, in the past five years, it's really been an incredible to watch the data emerge and um, show the benefit for what was once considered a drug for diabetes and um, how that might be helpful across stages A through C for heart failure, um, both primary and secondary prevention. This meta-analysis was one of the earlier ones done in 2019 that looked at Empareg, Canvas, and Declare Timmy, all trials that were done with patients with diabetes. And they stratified by those who had a history of heart failure and those who had no history of heart failure. And I think what's really compelling is this um, hazard ratio is quite similar, whether an individual had a history of heart failure or had no history of heart failure, showing for the first time this really remarkable benefit for the primary prevention of heart failure for SGLT2 inhibitors. Since then, we've seen data from a variety of trials for how SGLT2 inhibitors can reduce the risk of recurrent heart failure in some of our heart failure trials shown here, um, DAPA, HF, and Emperor in chronic kidney disease patients and Credence, as well as those patients with diabetes who are at high risk for heart failure. The first panel here looks in the y-axis for events for hospitalization for heart failure, and the second panel is the composite of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure. And what I think is really important in this figure is how much greater the absolute risk reduction is seen in those individuals who were enrolled in trials who had prevalent heart failure. So if you already had heart failure, the absolute risk benefit of an SGLT2 inhibitor was greater given the greater risk coming into the study. While the axis here doesn't really help us see what the variation may be within these subgroups, but if we look at the group of primary prevention patients and we're better able to stratify who may be on the higher end of risk in that population, then we may also see a similar pattern of absolute risk reduction or greater benefit for SGLT2 inhibitors if we're able to identify who's at risk. What is the mechanism behind SGLT2 inhibitors, I think is still up for a lot of debate. We know there's of course a naturesis or uh, diuretic like effect that could be the reason why we're seeing such great benefit across the stages of heart failure for prevention, primary prevention or prevention of recurrent events or secondary prevention. But there's been many um, preclinical studies that have also highlighted different mechanisms, including oxidative stress, um, reduction in fibrosis, reduction in inflammation, as well as senescence, um, and potentially um, specific direct kidney benefits and renal protection, as well as myocardial protection that make these drugs such an important class for heart failure prevention. And I'll even propose that potentially should be called the statins for this decade for risk-based primary prevention of heart failure. So if we look across those stages of heart failure that we've talked about and where SGLT2 inhibitors have shown benefit now, starting really in uh, patients with diabetes, data in chronic kidney disease, and now also in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, as well as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, it's not a dissimilar story to what the story for statins were, were in the 90s, where we initially demonstrated benefit in those who had coronary disease and have moved upstream to identifying their use in primary prevention and it's been very effective in that case. This we originally published earlier this year and has been picked up by many others as well and I think is a really important way, not just as a catchy statement to say, but as a way to think about how we can potentially implement and identify those individuals who are at risk for heart failure and target them with SGLT2 inhibitors. While 
this has been a really exciting area. And I, I think there's a lot of um, potential benefit for SGLT2 inhibitors. We can't forget that there's a comprehensive approach that we want to take for risk reduction for heart failure as well. We showed some of the meta-analysis data that identified um, effective use of thiazide diuretics, ACE inhibitors, ARBs. There's also data for MRAs in primary prevention and focusing on risk factor management and intensive blood pressure control as well as lifestyle interventions will be important to take a holistic approach to prevention of heart failure. So over the um, last 40 minutes, we've talked about how using or developing a risk prediction tool, externally validating it and identifying evidence-based interventions sets us up for the future paradigm of risk-based prevention of heart failure. And it really leaves this last step, implementation. And how do we go about that at this point to take what we know in terms of a multivariable risk score and translate it for risk-based prevention to achieve heart success? This will happen at the clinician patient level for discussion with both short-term and long-term risk estimation, focusing on optimizing lifestyle behaviors and risk factors, and potentially identifying a high-risk subset for surveillance testing like echocardiography and biomarkers that we won't spend as much time talking about today, but I think is also really exciting as ways to um, help um, with precision prevention. To start to do some of this work, we were so fortunate to be funded by the American Heart Association and um, have begun a study to use um, our risk-based model, the PCPHF model, to identify individuals in our health system that are at risk. So we've leveraged new cats in the electronic data warehouse, the EDW, to identify individuals who have a risk of at least 5% over the next 10 years have been um, using REDCap, especially during the pandemic, to e-consent and complete online questionnaires. With our goal to randomize 100, of which I'm pleased to say that we're almost 80% of the way there over the past year, and, and uh, randomize individuals to a pharmacist-led intervention for intensive risk factor control versus usual care. And we'll be looking at biomarkers and echocardiography at one year to see if there's been a difference. And this is really a pilot study, a small sample to show feasibility, um, but I think maybe an exciting way that we can potentially apply these risk models to focus prevention of heart failure. So I'll conclude with these five key takeaways. Um, heart failure prevention is urgently needed as we see growing rates of mortality and hospitalization and heart failure is largely preventable. In order to do this, we need to calculate short and long-term heart failure risk with multivariable risk prediction models. Third, we wanna identify risk-enhanced populations so we can personalize and reclassify risk for whom targeted prevention is needed. We discussed how we can intervene on heart failure risk by optimizing lifestyle and intensive risk factor level lowering. And lastly, incorporating SGLT2 inhibitors as the statin of heart failure for a risk-based approach to primary prevention. And with this, I think we can transform our paradigm from one of heart failure to heart success. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. Happy to take questions. Well, Sadia, thank you so much. That was really, truly outstanding. And, you know, just a wonderful, I think, catalog of your campaign. And, you know, for, for maybe younger investigators out there or, or medical students, you know, if you, if you wanna see how you take an original research question and turn it into a campaign that actually shifts paradigms in clinical care, you just saw a terrific example of how that can work. Um, bringing in, you know, surrounding the question from all different sides, bringing in public health data, bringing in clinical data, bringing in electronic health record data, um, leveraging data that exists from ongoing population-based cohort studies, leveraging data from uh, clinical trials that are freely available. Um, all of this has really contributed to the, the campaign that Dr. Khan is leading, and as you can see, remarkably successfully leading. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you want to emulate someone, um, you know, in, in having your research question turn into something that changes the way we practice medicine, you just saw a fantastic example of that. So, Sadia, thank you so much for that really wonderful kind of um, a discourse about you know what you've been up to for the last five or six years, and I think the exciting future, of course, of implementing this now in, in the clinical setting. So I wonder, I, I, I want to encourage people to please put your questions in the Q and A. We'll be keeping an eye on that. But but um, Sadi, I wonder if you could kind of just actually nuts and bolts this. You know, 
Walk me through, if you're seeing a patient in the clinic who has some risk factors for heart failure, when do you implement the calculation? What, what do you do? What do you consider for personalizing that risk assessment? And how does it change your answer uh, from what you calculated? And then when would you reach for that next step of maybe measuring a BNP or doing a, a, an echocardiogram? So kind of just walk us through soup to nuts, what you would do with a new patient you were seeing in clinic who might be at risk for heart failure. Yeah, thanks, Don, and, and thank you so much for your kind words. I, I think it's really been inspirational to watch how this has made such a difference in our approach to ischemic heart disease and really trying to emulate that. And so while we know that patients who are coming in oftentimes for preventive counseling already have a risk factor, I think this is also really helpful and perhaps maybe more helpful for those who don't yet have a diagnosis of hypertension or diabetes, particularly because as I showed that continuous association. So if someone who has prehypertension and has prediabetes and may have a slightly elevated BMI may end up at the same risk as someone who has hypertension and that's their only risk factor. So I think one of the things that this really helps is helping to integrate multiple risk factor domains for the patient as well, who may be more attuned to, well, I think I just need to watch my blood pressure to think about what other strategies may be. So I think that's first and being able to have that conversation more holistically or comprehensively, I think gives us a good starting point. So within that discussion, one of the things that we spend a lot of time talking about is what are the non-pharmaceutical approaches? What are the lifestyle approaches that can help improve um, risk and improve risk factor levels to be able to lower overall risk as well as improve heart health? In addition to that, if there are risk factor levels that need to be treated, what are the best medications that we might wanna use? So particularly in patients with diabetes where we do have data now for SGLT2 inhibitors, reaching for that first. In hypertension, looking for our ACE inhibitor or a combination ACE thiazide might be a really appealing one for someone who has high risk for heart failure as well. And really using this as a platform to follow up as we're assessing and engaging with how risk factor modification is going um, over the long term. Yeah, so one of the things that I think you know your your recent work has really focused on, you know, in particular, is how, how do you integrate information about what may have happened to a woman during pregnancy? Something like if, you know if she had preeclampsia or or had gestational diabetes, how does that change your thinking about her future risk? You know, based on, yeah, you've got her risk factors that are sitting in front of you here today, but if she, she then tells you, well, I had this, you know, these events with pregnancy, what does that do to your thinking and how might you be more or less aggressive? Might have planted that question. I think that's a really important one, particularly because sometimes that doesn't come up in the discussion. So I think the first thing to highlight and emphasize is how important that complete reproductive history is during a cardiology or primary care visit as well. And being able to know those um, adverse pregnancy outcomes or complications like preeclampsia, but even more broadly than that, preterm delivery, as well as delivering a small for gestational age infant have all been associated with increased risk for heart disease and particularly heart failure. And it can be up to a two times greater risk where not only is the burden greater, but that the risk of onset is earlier. So it's much more likely that that uh, woman may be experiencing heart failure in their 40s or 50s and much earlier than others. So I think one of the questions you raised is how can we use this information? And I think within the discussion of what are our um, risk factor uh, tools is potentially intensifying blood pressure lowering earlier getting to that lower level, even as a young person, and um, being able to um, focus on those risk factor levels more intensely. And that really, I think, is the importance of these risk enhancing factors is bringing people forward that maybe are doing okay. And if they didn't have this other risk factor, you could let them try physical activity, change diet, but being a little more aggressive and earlier on, I think is really important. So our, our good friend and colleague, Dr. Pablo Dennis has, has a, a great question here. You know, we, we think about this analogy of, of flozins, SGLC2 inhibitors to statins. <clears throat> the statin, you know, the, the statin paradigm works so well because cholesterol is in the plaque. And, you know, clearly what we do when we give a statin is we take away the fuel for the plaque and we change the biology of the plaque by removing, you know, that, that lipid core, if you will. Um, 
what's the biological analogy of how of how flozins might be working mechanistically to uh, to reduce the risk for heart failure? I think that's a great question, and I don't know that anyone has the answer, so I'm not going to feel too bad about not having a perfect answer, and is really potentially one of the exciting parts about the pleiotropic benefits of the flozins. I think many have postulated that some of the inflammation and the fibrosis that occurs with increasing risk level for heart failure, and as someone progresses to having heart failure, both in the heart and in the kidney, are potentially places where the flozins can target and um, reduce some of that fibrosis and inflammation. And especially, I think, in patients who already have heart failure, that diuretic or naturetic effect can't be uh, downplayed because we see how effective the flozins can be very early on after administration. So I think there's probably multiple factors that play in that is part of why I think risk-based prevention of heart failure has been harder to, to really move forward because there isn't that clear biologic causal pathway where it's clearly cholesterol lowering that makes a difference um, for heart failure. It's multiple things. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific answer. Love that. So, so then we have, I think, a really important question also in the, in the Q&A here, and that is, you know, we, we you and I have, have focused often in our discussions about what is the clinician to do? How can the clinician be better? And I think, you know, that this is a great question, you know, how can the, the patient come to their appointment more prepared um, and in fact, sometimes maybe nudge the doctor to be a little bit more aggressive with their risk factors than would otherwise be the case. You know, how can the patient contribute to that clinician-patient risk discussion you know, around these kinds of issues? I love this question. I think it's incredibly important that patients feel empowered to push their doctor you know, when, when these kinds of tools are available. And the patient may recognize some risk that the doctor doesn't. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think a great point. And hopefully, as we are all evolving in our approach to integrate patients into our research, this will become more and more part of clinical practice as well. There was a really um, interesting recent study that was done um, in patients with heart failure, where the patients were primed with an app and told about um, specific changes that might come for their medicines or GDMT or guideline directed medical therapy. And in fact, those patients that received the priming tool prior to their appointment were more likely to have intensification of their treatment. And that was in patients with heart failure. But I think the same could be applied here and starting to engage and prime our patients before they come to their visit of what are the questions to be asking? What are the potential options that may reduce some of the, if it is inertia, clinical inertia and intensifying risk factor levels or um, focusing the conversation around this, um, this as well. Yeah, really nice study from our friend Larry Allen in Colorado. But, but you know, I, I think Steve Purcell right here at Feinberg has shown us that this sort of patient activation activities can really make the visit go more successfully um, and, and get to the, the kind of important needs that the patient has to reduce those important outcomes. So uh, another friend and colleague, Dr. Walia, has, uh, has pointed out that um, Sympathetic tone might be involved in some of the mechanism here in preventing heart failure. But then as you may see, you know, she's asking about implementation methods to help improve the inequity in flows and use. And we certainly see that, you know, these are newer, not yet generic, maybe in the next two years, but kind of expensive, a little bit difficult to get out of the payers, uh, even if we prescribe them for people in whom they're clearly indicated. Um, how do we kind of implement these a little bit more successfully and try to reduce those inequities? Yeah, I think that's a really important point and one that is important, not just to the flozins, but really broadly to how we approach risk factor control. We know that blood pressure levels are more likely to be uncontrolled among uh, non-Hispanic Black patients, as well as patients without health insurance. And so speaks to kind of a larger question of what are the policies that are needed to help ensure not just healthcare access, but high quality healthcare access. So even if a payer is willing to provide the um, you know best top line drugs that we think are are relevant is the copay accessible? Is it really the um, is it something that is affordable? And so I'm rephrasing the question because I don't have an answer beyond I think thinking about how we can approach this on a policy level. Yeah, but certainly identifying patients who need it is an important first step, and you know we, we can we can leverage things like the EDW and other tools for those best, best practice alerts and things like that. But I agree with you. I mean, I think, you know, the example of the PCSK9 inhibitors comes to mind where 
we've really leveraged our specialty pharmacy colleagues who do a wonderful job, you know, kind of battling the payers and making the case that this is a patient who clearly will benefit from this drug. Let's get it for them. And, you know, I think that that um, we need to uh, pull in our allies, uh, you know, from specialty pharmacy and, and other fields who can really help us, you know, navigate these somewhat tricky waters. And, and uh, I think equity is really the, 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 you know, the border zone, the horizon of where we need to get to because, you know, we have trouble getting it for a lot of patients, regardless of their, their healthcare coverage status, but um, it only widens those disparities. So we really have to make sure that we approach this from an equity lens. Totally agree. Great question. Um, other questions or other thoughts, Sadia, that um, that you want to share with the group before we uh, before we close this really wonderful session? Um, I think you alluded to this in part of our earlier discussion as well that we didn't really have time to get into here. But I think the whole next phase is how we can use these risk tools to potentially um, find those people that may benefit from more intensive surveillance. So we have great tools like echocardiography, BNP different ways to better reclassify risk and identify people that may be asymptomatic or very close to pre-symptomatic so that we can uh, intensify treatment further. And I think that that's really the next place to try to focus. We know that population-wide approaches to BNP screening or echo screening are not gonna be cost-effective um, or may not be very cost-effective, but if we can zero in on those people that are at the highest risk based on their traditional risk factor levels, that might potentially allow us to target those people for um, really refining and reclassifying risk. Yeah, I like that. You know, it really kind of feeds the, the Bayesian approach that we often take in clinical medicine of, you know, what's that pretest probability? How can I change that pretest probability with new information in a sequential testing format so that I move somebody who I think is maybe, you know, intermediate in their risk and really figure out, are they truly low risk? Are they truly higher risk? And, you know, what, what do I need to do in decision making as a result of that? And I, I think it fits really well with just how we're trained to think. And so it, it works nicely. I love that you're heading down that path. Um, we are close to the top of the hour. I know I have to go to clinic um, and I'm sure many of our folks are off to, to other things too, but Sadi, I wanna thank you for a truly remarkable recitation of you know what is shaping up to be a remarkable career and you are changing paradigms and making a difference in the clinical care and prevention of heart failure and in so many different areas. Um, so I just wanna say how proud we are to be able to work in, and uh, collaborate with you and uh, thank you so much for sharing this. Thank you also to IFAM and NewCats for sponsoring these really wonderful Thursday seminars. I hope you all have taken as much out of this as I have and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you back here again. Also wanna wish everyone very happy holidays and um, hope you have safe, safe travels if you travel. Thank you so much.